All right, all right, all right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this amazing video. I am super excited about today's guests, Melanie and Devin Duncan. Um, we recently had a mastermind in New York City, which is just a, a meeting where a bunch of uh, successful people get together and talk about what's working in business and whatnot. And I knew Melanie and Devin had a pretty successful offline business. And uh, anyway, just through talking to them, I was fascinated with their story and their business and kind of how they run it. And they truly live the dream, in my opinion, where they have a business that is generating, I think, millions of dollars of revenue. We'll, we'll find out here a little bit. But lo loads of, uh, of good revenue, good sales, and they have got it to the point where it's almost on autopilot and they're spending very little time. So welcome, Melanie and Devin. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. good. Thanks, Sean. Great. Hi, Sean. So you guys have a business um, or a couple businesses, custom Greek threads and luxury monograms. Is that right? That's, That's correct. correct. Yeah. That's right. okay. They're both uh, yeah, e-commerce stores online and custom Greek threads uh, specializes in selling Greek apparel to fraternities and sororities. Okay. And so these are online stores where people find your products buy them and then there you guys have a warehouse somewhere that fulfills the shipments and gets them set yeah, up. Yeah, correct? that's correct. Yeah, we have a manufacturing facility in Southern California in Orange County and uh, all of our marketing is done all online. Uh, it's something that's very unique to the, to the Greek industry specifically. Most Greek companies go to actual campuses and try the old school marketing way of you know going to the Greek houses, taking orders and then fulfilling them. And that's kind of the funny story is when we started the company, we were still very much immersed in the old way of marketing. We were going door to door. We were spending thousands of dollars traveling to different campuses, different um, conferences, not really seeing the return on investment, really not seeing the return on investment. And so we kind of as a last ditch effort, I mean, our partners had left us. We were really kind of thinking, let's give this a few more months and then I think we need to scrap this idea. And Devin had the brilliant idea of paying some kid that wanted to search engine optimize our site. And we're like, SEO? What's an SEO? Okay, sure. Why not? You know, we've got nothing to lose. And literally, I think it was in a few months, we started making more money in that next few months, getting orders from all over the country. How did someone order from New York City? We've never been there. And so it was really, it was this new and, you know, embracing this new world of online marketing. So we started doing Facebook ads. We're like, I don't know if this is even going to work, but uh, pretty much within six months we were hooked. We pulled all of our other funding out of doing, you know, foot traffic type of advertising and switched entirely to online. And now we just, we're having our first $2 million year just with custom Greek threads this year. Holy cow. All right. Well, let's, this is awesome. So. Let's rewind a minute. Kind of tell me about the birth of your business. Yeah, yeah. So it was about five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we were both in college. And the funny story is neither of us were in the Greek system. So I my, find that so hard to believe. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So we have the largest Greek company in the world now, and neither of us were Greek. All of our friends were, and we were, you know, around it all the time, as anyone, you know, in, you know, in college life is. But uh, my little sister was actually in a sorority, and we went to... Uh, we met up in my um, in Montana at my family's lake house for summer break, and she. What these fraternity and sorority kids do is they buy they call, uh, their letters, their sweatshirts with the Greek letters on them. They buy them for their little brothers or little sisters when they get initiated, and they yeah. give them as gifts. So she was gifting her uh, her little sister's first set of letters. And I was looking at it and uh, realized how easy it'd be to make these. And you know, I was like, how, you know, how much did you, how much did you spend on this sweatshirt? And I had a, I had a little bit of experience with making, uh, you know, sweatshirts and customizing them. And uh, she's like, well, I spent one hundred and fifty dollars on each of these sweatshirts. And she what? had like three, she had like three of them to give them. Yeah. And I looked at it and I'm like, I'm like, this would cost me like twenty five dollars to make in probably about twenty minutes just you know pay for the machine time I already have the wholesale accounts so let's just I could I could make you know a lot good profit for a college kid just by doing all my friends stuff at you know where I went to school so you went what did you do your next steps you went and bought a couple dozen t-shirts sweatshirts yeah yeah, yeah. so oh, so my next step was uh, you know obviously going and talking to my my Greek friends and being right. like okay is there a demand for this is somebody already doing a really good job filling this 
And all the stores uh, that these kids were going to were just local mom and pop stores. And yeah. because of that, they can only service the local area because they weren't advertising nationwide or doing anything like that. And they also couldn't really scale because it, they were very dependent on just the local school. So yeah. huge complaints were that you know these kids had to actually go to the brick and mortar store to place the orders. And then their wait times could be months, actually. It wasn't uncommon, especially during the fall busy season. So there was a huge, a huge need for an improved service. So we started looking at what how could we better, you know, better fulfill this? Well, first of all, we didn't want to have, we want to keep our expenses very low. You know, we want to be totally bootstrapped. So we're like, let's let's throw up a web page, and that will be that'll be our store. Okay, so <coughs> that was your. Did you was the did the web page come before you made your first products and went to your friends and said, would you buy this or? Um, no, we went to our friends and were like, hey, where's is is there a need? Is there a demand? Learned all about the local store. Went and kind of you know spied on them, checked it out, right. saw saw the machinery they were using, made sure we were, we kind of understood the basic process. Yeah, I mean, it progressed many stages from there, but it started with, you know, some recon in a quilt store and then working, you know, manufacturing in a garage, which is funny to talk about now. You know, we're all dressed up in our fancy smancy New York apartment, but the truth is, I mean, we really worked as, you know, basically sweatshop employees for the first year. That's awesome. So what was that time frame like, Devin or Melanie, from... The vacation to talking to people, figuring out it's a good idea, and did you put up a website and get the sewing machine at the same time? So yeah, all around the same time because we we didn't put up the website until we actually made sure we could manufacture a quality product. All right, so you went from July Fourth weekend, you went on a trip, you you hatched the idea with business partners, came back in late August. Yeah, so late August, you were buying a sewing machine and starting to build a website. Yeah. And and we were taking orders. We were basically taking orders then, because uh, even even without a website, I think right when I was building the basic website and the website, I think too many people put focus on like everything has to be perfect before they launch an idea. Like we really just we were constantly like behind the ball. Yeah. Like you know, we we built a website in. I think I built it in just a night. I think I pulled an all nighter. Late August, early September, you started taking orders. Yeah, and yeah. you could do this because the typical lead time was maybe a month, two months, so you didn't feel stressed about not actually being able to produce it right that minute. So you were taking orders in advance. Or... <laughs> well, that's one of the things we tried to promise is we wanted to be uh, one of the things that made us, you know, really attractive company in the beginning was that we wouldn't we'd get these orders a lot faster than mom and pop shops were. Right. Um, one of the downsides of having a mom and pop shop. Is that they had to be taking orders or doing customer service during the day, and they usually manufacture at night. And because we had an online store, we could just be making stuff all the time. So, all right, this is great. And I, you know, you've brought up a lot of cool things. I always tell people when I get asked for advice on this, it's like generally, if you have an idea and you don't have to worry about doing it perfect, just do something and get it out there. And that either you're going to see early sales or early results that regardless if they're profitable or not, they're going to be inspiring enough to let you know, A, you had a great idea. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then at that point, you know, you can go back and start refining the process and refining things to maximize profits or get it to actually to a profitable standpoint. But I love it. So you guys totally bootstrapped, just ran for it. You were probably losing money in the beginning. What was it like from concept? We've gotten, we kind of established you guys launched August, September, October ish after, you know, thinking about it in or, coming up with the idea in July. What was um, what was your first kind of $1,000 month? Um, well, we, we hit $1,000 our first month just because month. with the sweatshirts being, you know, 80 to 100 bucks and we get one order, you know, it's a couple Boom. grand. Okay, all right, so I guess moving along, did you guys have a mentor when you started out? <laughs> uh, Probably your dad. Yeah, I mean, not really someone that had been in this specific industry. My family is very entrepreneurial. So and so, just that whole spirit of starting your own business and doing your own thing has always been in my blood, but not someone that's like, oh, what do we do? How do we how do we set up a UPS shipping account? How do we how do we set up a merchant account to accept credit cards? Not no one that we could go and uh, ask questions like that, really. Keep All right, so starting out, this was five years ago, right? Yes. What was first year sales like? Um, it was probably like around twenty-five to thirty, I would think. Okay. And I'm assuming that there was very little profit. 
Oh yeah. Oh, no, they were they spending were that Cause... to go to the conferences. I mean, yeah. they were paying a thousand dollars to put up an exhibit booth and then flying. You know, we we're flying people out to these conferences to go sit at the booth for three days of the conference. So their flight, their hotel. I mean, just that in itself. I think we spent close to twenty grand in just trying to market ourselves the first year. Yeah, but I think after the first eight months, when we kind of reevaluated the business, even though we had brought in like twenty-five, thirty grand in revenue, we were forty grand in debt. Mm -hmm. What kept you going? Look, I don't know if I should, which question I should ask first. I'll, I'll start with this one. So I know at some point your business partners basically just said, we're done. We kind of want out. Was that yep. in that first year? Yeah, that was after like the first six or seven months. It was probably, um, if we started in September, it was before the next summer. It was probably in like, I think it, was May, summer. it was May or June probably the next okay. year. And that that was when that was when school was out. So now it's the slow season. So we kind of reevaluated and went, how and did this first year go? And you're getting ready to spend a bunch of money flying to more conferences and right. And do, yeah, well, at so. this point, also we had moved, so we were you know very comfortable in Southern California. We actually decided to move our entire operation to Dallas, Texas. What kept you going when you got to Dallas and things weren't looking good and sales were, were right? Slow? So we uh, that's when basically. It's a blessing and a curse, you know, it made us totally reevaluate how our marketing strategy for the business. Having those two partners, we had four of us in the business, me and Melanie and the two partners that could really, they were like our marketing force. And because of those, because of having, you know, four people, we we're like, oh, we can go to conferences, multiple conferences in the same weekend in two different locations. Once we lost our partners, we couldn't really do that anymore because Melanie and I had to work on manufacturing and run the whole business ourselves. So it forced us to cut, scrap the idea of going to conferences, which is what was bleeding us. That was causing all the debt. Mm -hmm. We're like, we need to cut, try and find another source to get orders. And that's did you, when did you have one of those like defining moments where you're looking at the cost of a conference, you're looking at the bank account, you're looking yeah. at the debt, and you're just like, absolutely. I don't yeah, know well, if we, we just, can even afford to do this. Yeah, we, just, we just knew we couldn't do it. Right. Yeah. We're so like, we that's when you're like, all right, light bulbs start going off. What can I do? What can I do? So I, I stumbled across some blog that talked about search engine optimization. Yes. So you paid some kid 300 bucks after realizing how important and valuable it could be. He well, and, and just essential for our business. We couldn't, we now lost the ability to actually go in person to Greek rows and knock on doors. Right. And we just didn't have that manpower anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the lifestyle has kept us going. I mean, we knew, you know, we met my sophomore year of college and we knew we wanted to be entrepreneurs. We knew we wanted to run businesses together. We knew we wanted to travel whenever we wanted, live wherever we wanted. Like I, Devin comes from a very entrepreneurial background. I, not at all. I mean, my parents were typical nine to five type of employees and I saw the life that could be. I saw the life we could have. You just have to go through it. This is how you learn. You learn through doing it. You don't learn through reading about it unless it's right. SEO. Well, the cool thing is I think, I mean, you guys probably agree with Lewis and, and myself and our business and yours. In the early days, you have so much excitement and motivation and those early wins, no matter how small they are, kind of propel you through all of that hard work and all that labor. And uh, yep. about the time you, you kind of start losing that excitement is when everything kind of like settles down and becomes consistent and good or at least for me that's kind of been yeah interest. but those those small early wins i mean i look back and i laugh but some of the biggest moments in our business were like you know minuscule compared to the long stretch but they absolutely were the mm -hmm. ones kind of okay so <clears throat> sorry so you guys are uh, you're in dallas you you read about seo because you're getting to the point where you can't do the conferences anymore you hire some kid from florida you pay him 300 bucks and and then what? You pay him 300 bucks and you're like, all right, cool, we moved up to page two, but we haven't gotten any orders yet? Or, or kind Well, of we, so we started seeing orders pretty quickly. I mean, within a couple of weeks, actually, just of by paying, doing... Of, of paying the kid and him doing his work. Yeah, I mean, all he really did was just basic stuff, Sean. I mean, just title tags, basic, just, you know, made it tags a description. Like, mm -hmm. the market back five years ago, what, you know, our main competitors were just, you know, all of them didn't understand SEO either. So it didn't right. take much to rank. So this was, what would you say, it was like in the August right around a year mark? When you start Basically a year from when we came up with the original idea. And you got that first order from Boston or... Yeah, it was, like, it was Washington, D.C. It was George Washington University. I, I, <laughs> still, I still have a picture of it on my phone. Oh, uh, how cool is that? And what was that uh, yeah. moment like? Uh, it, it was amazing. Well, it, it, it baffled me at first. I'm just like, we just got an order from Washington, D.C. 
and we're in California. I'm like, that that's crazy. And we haven't done any conferences there. We haven't like Did there you know did you know right away it probably came from the SEO? Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Because every other order before that, we we would know we knew where it came from. Oh, we met this kid at a conference. Oh, we've been dealing because we would always have to do before we ever got an order, we'd have to do a lot of work with the client. A lot we would meet them at a conference. We'd do a lot of follow up. We'd talk with them about their what their so order was. All gonna, this stuff that goes into it and then all of a yeah. sudden one day it's like, holy cow, we just got a huge yeah, order place. We, we just got an order with no work. Like, yeah, you're like, Woo-hoo! To get it. Yeah. We're like, that's so weird. We always had to do it. Our original idea wasn't scalable at all because it did so we'd have to work with the client just to and then we'd get the order. But now we got an order without ever knowing the client or ever talking with them. It's just like a bonus order. And we're like, that's amazing. How can we do more of that? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that was the moment. How can you do more of that? Was it, all right, just do more SEO? Or did they just start coming in naturally and you rose up the ranks? Or Right. So, yeah, at that point, it's like, okay, just study more. Like, that's where we want our business to go. Like, right. that's as fat, you know, just only do as much uh, of our current plan as possible. We're working with local clients to do the orders just to cover the cost. Everything else, let's put as much time and effort into learning and expanding these orders coming in automatically, mm-hmm. which you know, and, you know, which was more, which was SEO, of course, and then it expanded within the next six months, expanded into Google AdWords, you know, expanded into you know, Facebook, more, you know, Facebook, more social media efforts, things like that. As much referral mm-hmm. business as possible, we launched an affiliate program because mm-hmm. all of our customers know other potential customers because they're in Greek life. They so, meet every. So that means basically someone buys a, an order of 10 sweatshirts, you send them an email saying, hey, great, if you know anybody else, you can send mm-hmm. them this link, and if they buy anything, you'll get commissions for 20% yeah. of the order or whatever. How did that go? Did that work as well as you thought it might? Yeah, um, it, it, was, it was good enough. It helped, get, it helped encourage people to spread the word. So you guys had gone um, to a bunch of conferences, spent a bunch of money on that. We're getting dismal results from that. You did the $300 SEO thing, got that first order. What was that next like six months like? You you ventured in, you ventured into further SEO, did more SEO work. Did you see yourself go from page two to page one to the third position, the second position, the first position? Or- yeah, that getting on a page one was probably another six months, mm-hmm. and that's probably when we started Google AdWords. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, just by getting on page two, we started getting a we went, we went bootstrap again. Like we 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 sh- we rented basically just 300 square feet from one of my buddies that had a place in Santa Ana, California. When I moved the factory back to California, so it was only like 300 square feet. Because remember, this operation used to be out of my garage, so it was very small. Mm-hmm. And it, because it was just me and Melanie, like we didn't even have an employee. Like we would work till two or three in the morning just to get stuff done. I remember Devin would be running an order on a machine and like using our customer service chat. So we had chat on our computer and he'd be like running a machine and answering a question. Like literally, you just, you do it all. You do you what do. needs to be done. Oh, I love it. I love oh, it. Yeah. Okay. So that next six months, what were you saying, Devin? You went from, you went back to California. You started yeah. seeing the page two, started sending a couple orders a day, a couple a week. Like, yeah. Basically, because we were in a manufacturing business, we couldn't just, it would hurt us to blow up overnight. Because yeah, we, yeah, I get it, I get it. We couldn't fulfill the order. So right. we won't growth, but you know, only at like 10 to 15% a month. Like, you know, scaling at that, it's expensive. And Did you it's, ever think so about that and like drill it down? Like we don't want to grow too fast or was it yes. just kind of Oh, hard? yeah. We talked about the first few years were like, Six months growing the business, six months trying to figure out how to manage that growth. Like we yeah. moved every time for every six months for I think two years. We moved every six months for three years straight for into larger years. factories. Wow. And I mean, we were trying to figure out we needed more machines. So then trying to figure out, I and mean, these are like sixteen to twenty thousand dollar machines. We now have how many embroidery machines? Uh, there's fourteen machines, and we run three shifts. So we run twenty four hours a day on fourteen <laughs> machines. But now. even finding all those machines, like trying to figure out other factories to buy them from, that where you could buy them like semi used but still right. have a warranty. And then these machines, I mean, they're big pieces of machinery that we would have to wait several weeks for them to arrive. So we would have, I mean, managing that growth. The growth was exciting, but it wasn't just, we were talking about this with like info products. You create the growth and then you just fulfill it. But yeah. with manufacturing, I mean, we had times where I remember Devin would come down to me. We ran our first Black Friday sale a few years ago. And I was downstairs and he came down and said, I think we have to turn off the website. Like, I don't think that we can actually make all of this in time for people. And so, yeah, there was a lot of stress and- um, Wow. 
wow. stress yeah. behind, you know, after we had created that amount of growth, after when the marketing was working, then we had to figure out how to fulfill and actually create a sustainable and profitable, profitable business because we then had employees. But if we didn't manage the staffing correctly, we were paying overtime, and then we were trying to upgrade people's orders to get it to them on time, you know, your profit margin just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's been a lot of learning involved. Huh. It's, I'm glad you mentioned that, Melanie, about the scaling, and that's kind of one of the, the questions I have. How did you handle that scaling? Was it, was, it, I mean, was it really thought out in the beginning, or was it more just um, Well, the biggest thing, biggest thing that was thought out was like, let's not – we knew all these areas we could go to try and test to get growth, but like we we don't want to try them all, like because if they work, we just we're screwed. screwed. Yeah. Right. So we would hold off. So when we were on page two of SEO, that was enough for us. Like, mm -hmm. let's just you know, it was only me and Melanie, and then we started taking on just a part time employee, mm -hmm. and you know that that was just enough. Like we didn't even have we didn't we didn't even pay this kid rent that we were you know he just let us use three hundred square feet of his place, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, we just we didn't want to try AdWords yet because that could sink. You know, that could sink us. It could be too much growth at once. And then right. we we grew a little bit more. We go up in the rankings. Maybe we try a little bit of AdWords just to to get the learning curve just for a couple key terms and see if that got us some business. And then you know, slow it down again. And we right. finally got our first space. I think it was like fifteen hundred square feet. We got it next door to my buddy's place. And I just remember it being like. It, you know, you going back, Sean, and seeing like those big wins, but also those really big risk decisions. That was a huge. Yeah. You're like, like, this is betting the farm. A really big, yeah, man. Is this the right decision? Yeah. You just stress over it forever, and you look up, back at it now, and you're like, that's nah, such a joke. Like that was such a small decision. <laughs> but at that time, you're just like, yeah. oh my gosh, should we lease our own space? Should we lease our own? Because we were locked in for what was it? A year lease? Yeah, it was a year lease, yeah. and it's that's just scary. Like it was going to be like funny. twenty grand. <laughs> yeah, that's it's such a long term commitment. Like. You know, we don't. We're, we're working ourselves slowly out of debt. Finally, you know, trying to get out of that forty thousand dollar hole that we'd created were that you, first year with our old business plan. Were you paying yourselves by year two yet? No, 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 no. no. We, we were, were you not. We were side still, jobs, or did you just had money saved up or we, support? We were, we were on our parents' scholarship plan. All right, so this is year two. You guys are crushing, or not crushing, but things are looking good. And it, yeah. what was the defining moment that? From a sales perspective, took and I guess scaling. I mean, did it just happen slowly over a two-year period where you went from okay, maybe we can start to pay ourselves, you know, midway through year two to okay, things are pretty good now and revenues are good and sales are consistent. And what kind of where was that transformation? I guess from. Well, I still vividly remember Devin used to have a sound notifier whenever we got an order. <laughs> yes, I love it. And it would be a cha-ching, like a, you know, like a cash register. Yeah. We, and so whether you know, we were funny, at we the, the office the or thing. at home, you know, having friends over for dinner, whenever we got an order, it would cha-ching. <laughs> and so I think, you know, we started, as we started to slowly, you know, grow and pace ourselves, we would have certain goals. Like, let's see if we can do... $10,000 in a day right. and we would do some sort of promotion or you know like really ramp up our advertising and we'd like hit 10 oh my god I remember when we hit our first $10,000 day we were so excited we didn't know what to do so we went out for frozen yogurt so we were, <laughs> we were in California and we're like we just made $10,000 we need to do something. And so, you know, it was like, late night, yeah. like, let's go to yogurt land. And I remember that day, $10,000 mm -hmm. and we went and got, and now it sounds so silly because, you know, we live in Manhattan. So when we really hit a goal, we just do something fantastic or yeah, we exactly. take a trip. You know, we, we've, we've gotten some pretty amazing reward system set up for ourselves. But I still remember that first $10,000 days. And yogurt land. We went to yogurt land to celebrate. <laughs> like, like you said, though, Sean, there's no, there's no bigger rush in those early wins. I mean, even... Even with the revenues we have now, we never I never feel that same excitement as when, when you're first beginning and yeah. you get those small victories. Yeah. And there it's you, you never big. have as good a feeling again. No matter if it's even if you have a two hundred thousand dollar day, it's not the same as when you had your first thousand dollar day. Yeah. yeah. No, I completely agree. And it's kind of a testament to that quote. I forget the quote exactly, but it's something like it's not about the destination, it's more about the journey. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, it totally is. It yeah. really is. It's so true. Oh, it's cool. All right. So we're, we're like getting really long here and I got like a couple, <laughs> a couple more good things I want to get out of you. So what was the point though, real quick, 
you hit that ten thousand dollar day. Was it year two, midway through year two, or was it year? That was, two, that was year probably three? year three, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so year three was about <laughs> the first moments where you're like, all right, we can start withdrawing an income from this, and yeah, yeah. And, and at that point, we started. We had read Four Hour Work Week mm -hmm. and got really sold on the idea of you know, being removing ourselves from this business and creating a lifestyle business. And so we started looking, because all these orders were coming in automatically, we didn't really, you know, we didn't need to go after the orders really, like calling places anymore. So we started working from home more and started removing ourselves from this business and started thinking, what is do we this want in year this? three? Is this year that was year three. three. This is Isn't year it three. funny, just backing up, because I read that book and we talked about this, I think, in New York. It had a big impact on me. But it, it's funny to me when I think back how young and naive I don't know, I was and you were when I read that book. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can totally remove myself from my business. And then that belief actually created the reality. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we started making decisions and taking risks specifically to make our business take, you know, a shape that could be, you know, like for our work we've talked about. So we did mm -hmm. things that were not smart in the short term, but fulfilled our long term goal of being able to live cross country and run, run this company from New York City that yeah, is still in Southern California. For example, we took a three-month honeymoon. That was one of the first ways we kind of tested it. Is after we were married, it was slow time, so it wasn't a super high stress thing because it was a slower time in volume. But we thought, okay, let's give this a shot. We're gonna leave for three months. We traveled all around Europe. We actually rented an apartment in New York for a month. Um, but at that point, we determined, okay, there's still a lot we have to do. So we moved back to California for one more year, and that's when we really, like Deb said, we tried to stay out of the office as much as possible. We started to train all of our employees and all of our managers to work with us. You know, we started using Basecamp from 37 Signals. We started to train them, even though we were just about 20 minutes away. We started to work as though we could have been, you know, across the country or across the world. Yeah, I think that's important because you guys ultimately have the safety net of being right there and getting in there if you needed to. But right. Uh, uh, so it's, okay, it's, and just to kind of help, I guess, in whoever's uh, the viewer's mind, how this is even possible. And, and you guys went twenty five grand first year. What was the second year sales like? Probably like sixty. Sixty, that little. But you oh, still, yeah, it's it was a big so improvement. Small. But well, because also the the whole business plan had changed. Right, and that you was know, right about start the time. Going, was yeah, I mean it was still really low. I mean and we didn't hit our year. our first six figure year until probably like year three when we finally started breaking even and started seeing being able to pay our own rent. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you this then: if so, you're um, you're three, you're already thinking about distancing yourself from the business, but barely breaking yeah. even and and. Uh, Okay, yeah. interesting. But you could see the potential and see the growth, probably. Yeah, we want we want to start that plan from when we were really small. Right. You know, we started oh, looking it's at brilliant. We, it's brilliant. See, the thing was, Sean, like we our initial goal had been fulfilled. We can at least cover our expenses. But the thing was, we had a job still. Right. It doesn't matter if we own it. We still just work for ourselves. Like you know, we're working in our business. It yeah, probably and, like sweat sweatshop rates. Yeah, you know, and that's that's not what that's not the lifestyle we wanted right. and we, that we thought was our you know that was our ultimate goal. And so we read for our work week mm -hmm. and got just inspired with the idea and started thinking, okay, we're still small, we can still tailor this thing to be to fit the lifestyle that's that we so, want. So it truly was lifestyle design because when we had this conversation before, I had it in my head that you, know, you guys were bringing home multiple six figures. And you're like, all right, now we need to kind of remove ourselves. And you kind of had that luxury, I almost entertain the thought. But uh, you truly designed it from the beginning, which I think is awesome. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Awesome. Was the removing yourself from the business was being away for three months one of the first times you did that? It, it was. And it, it was the first time. And it scared us to death. I mean, it was totally just that that cliff that entrepreneurs just fear. Like, oh my gosh, what if this happens? What if this happens? Yeah. It just, yeah. It's terrifying. And we we're like, but what do we want more? We want this. We want this business to fit this lifestyle that we that we dream of. And you spent some time prior to that leaving, making sure that those guys had it dialed and as much as possible. So the thing yeah. is, you never really know until you leave. It's, right. it's problems you never even guess could come up. Okay, uh, so you took that first three month thing, and you're just like, crap. This could be the death of us, or it could be the beginning of of what we designed. What was the? What what point did you get comfort? Two weeks, a month, two months? Did things were running smooth? It was really interesting. I specifically remember um, we started working. You know, we took the first few weeks. It was our honeymoon, so we yeah. didn't work, but um, with a little bit, not a lot. 
<laughs> but um, I remember when we got to Paris, we started to be like, all right, you know, we both love to work together. So we started to like, let's go to, to like the Jardin de Tuileries, which is the garden outside of the Louvre. And we brought our laptops. We're like, okay, let's start like brainstorming. Let's start talking about like, you know, strategically, what do we want to do this year? What are our plans uh, with our business? And I remember we started putting together these ideas, and it was. It was in the Garden of the Louvre in Paris that we decided, let's try Facebook ads. I remember I told Deb, I'm like, you know what? I'm spending a lot of time on Facebook. I think a lot of our customers on Facebook, I think we should advertise. And Deb was like, all right, if you want to advertise on Facebook, go for it. And um, I think it was very interesting because we had this epiphany. When we were working in California, we would go into our office we would spend all day doing busy work, basically yeah. having someone go. Yeah. I, I still remember yeah. like our customer service girl would be like, ah, the printer's not working. We'd be like, okay, let's go Stop fix the printer. What you're doing. Yeah. Oh, you know, this guy is here. He has a question for you about, you know, the internet. Okay, great. Go do this. And so we would come into our office and instead of coming in and doing this broad level of strategy and really figuring out where we wanted to take the business and grow and shape it, we were so in it. And our employees in particular, when we were there, we were accessible. So even though there was stuff they could probably do on their own or figure out, well, if we were just, you know, down the hall, they were going to come in and ask us. And so we were constantly being pulled right. in tons of different directions. And we were both working on different areas of the business. So the two of us actually would not even see each other in our office all day when really we wanted to work together and kind of harness our marketing and our overall strategy together. So it was unbelievable. I never realized that we would actually become more of an asset to our business by being out of our office, but we did because we were able to work on growing it and managing it in more of a larger scope than we were able to do when we were in our office. And also, it actually trained our managers from early on to be very effective at working on their own. <laughs> What's a um, so you guys are now five years in? Yeah, and you said what you just did a couple million last year with Greek thread, custom Greek threads. Yeah, last year was 1.8 and this year is going to be 2.25. Okay, so it's obviously still growing. It's doing great. How many hours a month do you spend working on that business right now? Uh, Melon doesn't work in it at all and I probably spend about five hours a month. The thing that, that really makes it work is that we don't have any salespeople or anything in our office. All the business comes in automatically through automation on the internet. AdWords, SEO, Facebook ads that just the campaigns are set and run themselves. So every day the staff comes in and they just print all the orders that came in in the last 24 hours. They had nothing to do with getting them. Their job, this they just think it's a magic printer. It just prints off hundreds of orders a day. And their job is just to make them all and to get them out on time. That's that's all that that whole factory has to do. Do you uh, do you ever like wake up in the morning and just check to see how many sales you did and then just kind of giggle because like while you <laughs> slept, you built well, this machine? Thing we didn't talk about that we did start to really harness the third year was email marketing. We that started was one of my very, questions. I want to ask okay, about Okay, okay, I won't get social. to it, no, 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 but that cool. was a magical ingredient. Okay, yeah. so, and I'm sure a lot of that happens, that creates that, uh, you're probably saying that because you can send an email at night and then you see orders coming in all through the night versus right. the traditional and, orders, yeah. And the concept of having pop-ups, so you're capturing leads yeah. Even you know if they don't place an order, um, the concept of uh, you know like Aweber, like follow up sequences. Let's, let's talk about right. that for a second. So right. you guys built an email. How important is email marketing to your revenue and your business now? Huge. huge. So important. yeah, huge. Absolutely. Okay. In every business, and it's something that we do that really sets us apart from our competitors. Yeah. yeah. So you said email marketing is extremely important. How about um, social? How important is, is social media marketing? Um, it, it's big for us mainly because of our customer base. They're all in college, so they're all going to be online. You know, they're all on Facebook, and they all know potential customers. When you're right. in a fraternity or sorority, there's there's potentially thousands of other people on your campus that you probably know, hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And so, if, you know, it's very valuable for us to go after you know likes and Facebook shares and things like that because when someone shares something on their news feed eventually hundreds of their friends that are potential customers target audience and yeah. see it exactly exactly so it's very important for our strategy and so that's really helped us grow really quickly you guys this is what I think is really cool here um, you then <laughs> went to the internet marketing conference Saw an idea, and I know you've built a million, multi-million dollar business, I think, or close to that, uh, from that. I don't even really want to get into that, but I just think it's fascinating how you've kind of uh, grown in a lot of different ways and done that. So you've done that. 
let me ask you this now. What does a typical day look like, a typical day or week or month look like for the two of you as far as your involvement in your act, in your Greek threads, the custom monograms, you know, businesses look like? Um, Melanie has nothing to do with it. Right. <laughs> and, uh, well, for those businesses, you don't. With luxury monograms? Well, what do you do with luxury monographs? I still handle a lot of. Anyways, how many hours? Uh, he doesn't know what I do. Apparently, yeah, not, not <laughs> very much. little. Everything we work on is to lay a foundation, so we don't have to go back and do it again. Got it. So the things that we work on, you know, like I'm still handling a lot of our customer service, training our manufacturing on certain areas where we're doing promotions for our luxury monograms, but. It's doing things once that you shouldn't have to do again because ultimately, like putting how the right I spend systems time, in place. Yeah, yeah, putting systems exactly because now that we have custom Greek threads running really smooth, luxury monograms is just about right there, and uh, most of our day to day is now just putting those systems into place. That's awesome. Okay, so Devin, you said earlier you work about five hours a month with custom Greek threads, right? Um, what do you guys do with your time? I mean, Melanie, it seems like you're pretty, you both still a little bit involved with the luxury monograms, getting that more active and, and streamlined. But what do you do with your times? You know what I mean? Um, basically, for the last seven, eight months, has been working on the info product, Sean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, and that's your that new market. kind of like multi million dollar business you've built and run. Yeah, that's been our biggest focus. So, other than the half a dozen hours I spend on custom reef threads, which mainly that is just submitting payroll. And then going over, I get daily and weekly reports from each of my managers. What's been the most influential business book you've ever read? And you know, kind of what did you take? How did you apply it towards your business? Why? Why was it, I guess? Um, I would say rework. Again, that's you know from 37 Signals Base Camp. Love them. Love them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I just love the mentality. I think because I didn't grow up with an entrepreneurial background, I always thought a business is this like so intimidating, overwhelming, like you have to have hundreds of staff and it has to be so complicated and I loved how Rework kind of turned that on its head and was like, no, the smaller the better, the leaner the better. You know, I love the analogy they use of the big ship. It always sticks with me. Like the bigger the ship, the harder it is to kind of turn it and to navigate and to, you know, quickly make decisive actions and moves. And that's so important. That's one of the most important lessons I've learned from running businesses is you have to stay so flexible. You have to be able to change something on a whim if you need to change it. And I think that's a lot of large corporations don't do or don't go where they should because they've already got such a practice in place. They don't stay nimble. And so I love Rework. I think a lot of their um, ideas of staying small, staying smart, um, staying bootstrapped really are important to remember even as you do hit those multiple million dollar marks as a corporation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel they cover so many different concepts. There's something in there for every type of business owner that yeah. they, every, so many different people I talk to have a different aha moment from that book. Yeah. It's not just yeah. one concept. There's so many different things. I love the thing about um, just getting projects shipping quicker, you know, get yeah. projects mm -hmm. completed, keep them small and nimble so you can complete them and, and see points of accomplishment. So many projects get bloated and oversized and you never they can never ship and never you know become active and as business owners it's it's so important to keep them really small mm -hmm. so you can do a little bit of work and see its results do a little bit of work and see its results instead of some large scale thing yes. how many times do we hear other business owners talk about like i've been working on my website for the last year it's just like well, what <laughs> i mean there's really no project we should ever work on that takes more than than 10 days mm -hmm. what's the biggest mistake you guys made in business so far <laughs> Um, well, yeah, there's two, there's two <laughs> answers to that. So one of them was about a bloated project and it was trying to get off, um, build a custom website. Um, and it just getting, you know, oh, let's add this too. Oh, let's add this oh, too. God. I'm just keeping it streamlined. I mean, I'm, we all know how that can go. And it never even launched. I ended up just scrapping it and I wasted probably about a hundred to $120,000 on it and never even used it. Oh, God, how funny Still drives me crazy. <laughs> what was your takeaway from that experience? Um, well, probably the same lesson we learned from rework to be keeping projects always super small and and you know we can reach a goal within x amount of days and if we can't like it's not a project we want to take on like a project should always be able to be broken down into small bite sized chunks yeah and then never take on a project until you have it broken into those chunks mm -hmm. yeah it's such a good I mean that's solid advice all right the number one reason our company is successful is 
because we always stayed really flexible. Um, our, our original idea for at least custom Greek threads morphed into something totally different than what we started it as because we allowed ourselves to be open to our feedback from our customers and constantly change and adapt to where the need was and where the desire was in the market. Oh God, I love it. All right. The number one reason we are not growing faster is? Because we, we can't uh, fulfill the orders well enough. We can't keep our, up to our reputation. Like the same reason we like would cut our Black Friday sale. Like we could have done a lot more, but if we can't over deliver on something, I'd rather you know take less revenue and keep our reputation pristine. If you could give one or two pieces of advice to entrepreneurs, and we, you guys have, I mean, just given a tremendous amount, so I'm really grateful. This has been awesome. But if, huh. if just summing it up, I guess the entire interview we've done so far, if you could give one to two pieces of advice to an entrepreneur, what would that be from your experience? Mine would be to just start. Um, this is probably bad, but you don't need a business plan. Like you need to have an idea and you need to have very small ways to start putting it out there. But I think like you said it earlier, I loved it. It was paralysis by analysis, something analysis like that. paralysis. Yeah. Yeah. Analysis paralysis. I think that you just need to get something out there. And I have tons of friends here in New York city that have these, all of these great ideas floating around and cheesy, but it is not about the idea, it's the execution. So you Love need it. to just do it. Our website, if I showed our first website to you, you would barf, like it's awful, <laughs> it's awful. But we have a website and then- I, I, can, I have the same better. story. Yeah, but you know, it got better and better and better. Our first sweatshirt, we made girls cry. But it got, now Now they cry because they're like, oh my God, it's so beautiful, I love it. Oh, it's great. Have to, it's only going to get better by doing it. So just start. Just start. I mean, we started with some of the ugliest messes ever. But it's you just turn it into something. So that would be my advice is you just have to start to get to where you want to be. Devin, she probably Forget. took your words, but what would you uh, say? My, my biggest advice would be to stay bootstrapped. Keep your expenses low while you're starting. It's it's always going to take longer than you think, mm -hmm. and you're it's always it's never going to work out like you think. No matter how much, yeah. how many of your friends tell you it's such a great idea and how fast you're going to be successful, it's always going to take way longer, and you're going to you know lose determination. Keep your expenses low. You're not going to be able to keep up a pace while you're you know while you took on all this debt or you know you quit your other job because you just know you're going to be successful within a month. Like keep another yeah. source of income. Be able to cover your expenses. Be be able you know to to have no expenses in this new business so you can be you can keep exploring and doing tests. I mean with our first business, even though I didn't know that in the beginning and we went forty thousand dollars in debt, I mean That it, wasn't in the business plan, right? Well yeah, yeah, definitely not in the but you know it's the same thing, like, oh of course it's gonna work. Of course we're gonna be successful. Yeah. Everyone yeah. thinks that when they start the business, but sure. if you didn't I mean we could have quit if it you know if we weren't able to you know still be on our parents dime luckily which not everyone has that blessing mm -hmm. but we were able to then second time around we were able to stay in the business long enough to like reevaluate and change things and find success again but it's it's very rare don't ever think you're going to be successful with your first idea you always have to get it in the market mm -hmm. learn from it change it tweak it I, I don't know anyone that's ever kept their business plan yeah. or their business idea the same before they launched to what it uh, what it is when it, when it was successful. They've yeah, always it was changed successful. Something. The people that fail are the ones that have this rigid idea of what they want to create and they won't <laughs> allow feedback to shape it and turn it into what it should be. Right. But I love what Devin said and I think it's an important message to drive home. All three of our businesses took longer to become profitable and made less money. Like I originally started luxury monograms. I'm like, this is brilliant. We're going to turn on the website, millions of dollars. It's going to flow in. And it ended up taking about six months to write around a year to get to that level we were looking for. And millions CGT of dollars flowing in? <laughs> no, not that level. <laughs> but I think that it does. Like CDT, you heard it. It really took about three years. Yeah, uh, I couldn't believe that. That's yeah, cool, instant yeah. gratification kind of plagues our society. Right. And the truth is, the business owner, it is about that perseverance. It's about, you know, I mean, the reason we outlasted our partners is because we just knew we had to make this work. And within about six months later, it did. And I think a lot of people kind of quit right on that doorstep of success. They're right there and they stop. And it's just that little, you know, there's no extra traffic in the extra mile. There's no traffic in the extra mile. It's that little bit of extra time and a little bit of extra effort um, where that's where it is. That's where the success is.
God, you know? I, I love what both of you guys said. We did a webinar with uh, Robert Greene, the author of 48 Laws of Power, mm -hmm. 50th Law, and some other uh, new book called Mastery. And someone asked that kind of question, I'm ready to quit my job and go into this. And he said, you know what? Uh, it takes a long time to kind of be a master at something. And if you want to reach the kind of success that you do, you're going to need to be a master at it. If I were you, I wouldn't cut off your lifeline, which is you thing you hate, your job now. I would keep it and then start spending as much free time as I could. Don't watch TV. You know, don't play on the computer, whatever, but spend as much free time as you could researching your new thing, learning it, becoming good, honing your craft. And at that point, you've got, you know, you're not cutting everything off because you're already at a certain level where you know you're going to see success once you do make that cut. Right. And I love what you said, Melanie. That's the advice I always give too because I know for me personally, uh, had I not just taken some leaps of faith and just gone after it and done it, and my whole life's kind of been that way, just diving in head first and doing it. Even, like you said, I mean, our first website, I mean, I built it myself knowing nothing about code. I'm like yeah. Googling like little snippets yeah. of code, how to do it, and then doing it, hitting save like right at the last minute. And like, had we not just taken that leap of faith and done it, you know, we wouldn't be where we're at. I have friends now that, you know, make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and they're horrible at what they do, but they do it and they execute it. I look at what they do and I'm like, oh my God, it looks horrible, but it works and it makes money and it's just because they do it and they've constantly learn and refine. So I love both those answers. I guess that I'll just turn it over to you for any final words. I know I already asked for your last advice, but any final words and then we'll wrap it up and uh, get the show on the road. Yeah, I would just say, you know, thank you for, for those of you that have watched this in its entirety or, you know, whatever <laughs> we ended up with. I just yeah. want to say thank you because I know when we started, we didn't know a lot of other entrepreneurs and we didn't really have anyone giving us feedback or guidance. And the last year or so, we've taken on some mentors and it's unbelievable the growth you can see when you stand on the shoulders of other people. <laughs> it's right. a night and day experience. So for those of you that you know are here, have watched this, I hope that there's been something that has really struck home with you or something that will really help to inspire you to do what you've been waiting to do because um, I wake up every day and I feel so blessed for the life that we have together. And it's really because we have just made that decision to <laughs> move forward and take action. Right. So hopefully that. that will be beneficial to some of you that have watched this. Where can, uh, where can people find you? So there's customgreekthreads.com. What are the other sites? Yeah, so Custom Greek Threads, if you need any Greek apparel, um, <laughs> for those of you, if you've enjoyed you know, some of our stories, some of our videos, you can go to melanieduncan.com. We've got a lot more video footage there, articles, resources. Um, love to connect with you further on that site. Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, thanks again so much. It's been a real thanks, pleasure. Sean. It's been a pleasure. All right, man. Talk to you guys later. All right. We'll see you.